Hello, thank you so much for joining us today for At Home with the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, The Hunger for Deed. I'm Gabriella Kahn from the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives Advancement Team, and I am so pleased to welcome you to our program. I want to gratefully acknowledge the Piscataway on whose ancestral homelands I live and where many of our Smithsonian locations are based, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home here today. I encourage everyone to learn more about the historic and current native communities in the area that you call home through your local museums and centers, as well as the National Museum of the American Indian. So as you probably know, the Smithsonian is celebrating a pretty big birthday this week. The institution turned 175 this past Tuesday, August 10th, which is the date that President James Polk signed legislation to establish this beloved place. And I know that many of you joining us today are rather knowledgeable about the Smithsonian and might already know this, but what we all now know as the world's largest museum research and educational complex actually began with a single bequest from an English chemist named James Smithson to the United States, a place that he had never visited to create an institution dedicated to the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Smithson's gift has always been somewhat shrouded in mystery, but dedicated scholars have uncovered much about him that has helped us better understand why he made the decision to entrust his wealth to the United States for this grand mission. When he made the choice to include this in his will, he could not have predicted how great of an impact his bequest would make and what the Smithsonian would become a beacon of discovery that reaches around the world and into the universe, an institution that is dedicated to the spirit of learning and to serving the public. But we do know that he believed that curiosity, science, and knowledge benefit humankind and make us all better. And he was driven to leave a legacy that would promote those values. As we've arrived at this milestone of 175 years of the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives has had the pleasure of acquiring the Hunger for Deed through an anonymous don donation. This 18th century document, full of family politics, legal proceedings, and historic context for an inheritance received by Elizabeth Macy, who was James Smithson's mother, has allowed us to add to the scholarship around Smithson and the institution's founding. And we are thrilled to share it with all of you and the world. Before we really dive in, I also want to give a huge thank you to our stewards of the, of the Hunger for Deed and our Smithson stewards, Mary and Clinton Gilliland, whose generous donations are going directly to support critical preservation to ensure our collective history endures for generations, educational exhibitions and programs that teach about the past and inspire for the future, and so much more. It's thanks to our supporters like the Gillilands our stewards and all of you that we've been able to help grow and share knowledge for 175 years and will continue to do so long into the future. So without further ado, I'd like to ask our resident hunger for deed expert to introduce himself. So uh, William, take it away. Thanks, Gabby. Hello, everyone. I'm William Bennett. I am a conservator at the Smithsonian Institution Archives, part of the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be here today with all of you to talk about the hunger for deed, something that has uh, captured my attention and been the source of study for the last 18 months uh, and even further back, to be honest. So I'm delighted to be able to share a lot of that with you today. Uh, and a bit about me, I'm a book and paper conservator, very specifically. I love books, I love old documents, and I did my conservation training in the UK. So as you'll see, there are lots of places where the deed becomes very close to my heart naturally. Uh, and I'm again, so excited to be here with you tonight and thrilled that so many of you could be here to join us. Thank you, William. So let's start at the beginning. How did the deed come to the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives? And what were some of your initial impressions? Well, so Gabby, as you said from the beginning, uh, we received the deed by an anonymous donation in 2019. Uh, 
Uh, the individual who donated the deed to us is a member of one of our other Smithsonian Museum boards who has a passion for the history of the Smithsonian and who has several connections in the art and antiquities world. And this was brought to his attention. And he knew that this needed to come to us at the Smithsonian. We knew that it was a property document. Uh, it's clear from the exterior information that that's what this is. And the little description on the exterior informed us that it was a contract dividing inherited family properties between the mother and aunt of James Smithson, our founding donor. What we didn't know though, was that the deed told a much richer and truly fascinating story than we would ever expect to find in a property contract. And I'm going to dive deeper into that as we talk through our journey with the deed from start to present. Yeah, so I, I will admit that I certainly wouldn't have thought that a property contract could be remotely exciting, but as we've talked about, you know, this deed could really be a great source material for a lively masterpiece theater series. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but before we get into the juicy details, um, can you tell us more about the deed as an object and, you know, sort of put on your conservator hat for a moment and tell us, you know, what were the first things you needed to do when you received the deed? Yes, of course. So the deed is written on parchment uh, and this is very typical for the period, of course. Uh, many sorts of documents of this type were written on parchment um, and parchment is a chemically treated animal skin. It is quite durable, it's stiff, it's strong and it has a bright appearance, which makes it really an ideal surface for writing on. The deed is made up of 16 parchment sheets and they're bound together with ribbon and thread on the bottom edge. Um, these were often folded up into, not often, almost always folded up into smaller packets after they were completed. So our deed was about 28 inches wide and 23 inches tall and has been folded down into a packet that's about 11 inches wide, and 13 inches tall, as you can see in this image, or at least it was when it arrived to us. And the description that you can see there is called an endorsement. And that was to help somebody figure out what it was without having to open it necessarily to know uh, a brief description of the contents. And this packet form, if you will, makes it kind of difficult to read and use. Parchment likes to stay in the shape or position that it's in, especially after a couple of centuries. And so we needed to open it carefully and flatten it some in order to make it easier to access. This took quite a bit of effort. Uh, I'd estimate about two weeks of on and off um, intervention to get it to a state where we could do so. Uh, and as it turned out, I was working to a bit of a deadline, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So what did I do? How do you flatten and relax a parchment deed? Parchment's very sensitive to moisture, and so one of the simplest ways to relax and flatten it is by humidification. You can see in the background there's a, um, a, a humidity chamber in the back upper right portion of our image, and that is uh, one of the tools that we use to make this happen. Uh, however, too much moisture, like with most library, library and archives materials, is never good. Um, and our parchment deed actually already has some water damage, so we took a careful and considered approach to doing this humidification. And we did that by um, working back to front, um, we use a gently humidified sheet of 100% cotton blotter to transmit moisture through a layer of Gore-Tex, just like you might find in some windbreakers or winter coats that wicks moisture away from your body. We were using it sort of in reverse to introduce moisture in a gentle and controlled fashion. This gave us a lot of control and a very gentle diffused uh, method of humidifying the deed. Uh, we also isolated each page as we worked on it with some polypropylene plastic sheeting so that nothing else would be affected while we were working on an individual page. Uh, if you look as well at the bottom of the deed, as you can see in the image, we were limited by the binding. It would have been a lot easier to work on individual sheets. We could have used our humidity chamber more directly, um, but the, so the binding constrained what we were able to do um, in a certain way, but we could, we would not consider taking it apart. It would be losing 
part of that uh, materiality and the history of the object. So we were comfortable working in those constraints, but it did have an impact on how we did that work. We didn't just have parchment to contend with though, there are other uh, components to the deed. And as you can see here, this blue paper tax stamp is one of those things that we had to consider. Every page of the deed has one of these attached. Uh, and um, students of American history will know that taxes and tax stamps in particular were one of the flashpoints for American colonists, which led directly to the American Revolution. We were not thrilled about paying taxes on things that we didn't feel we were adequately represented for in the British Parliament. English citizens, though, like James Smithson and his family, wouldn't have found these to be out of the ordinary. They were very much a part of normal life. Um, but we, we wanted to make sure that these were preserved. You can see that there's an embossed raised design on the stamp. And if we were to humidify that and then press it to, as we'll talk about in a minute for drying, we might lose some of that. And so we wanted to make sure that this was isolated from that process. So the blotters that we used had this cutout, as you can see in this image, to prevent moisture and pressure from getting to those tax stamps. So this process, um, we left the humidified blotters and the Gore-Tex in contact with the parchment until I could feel a difference in how it behaved. Um, a lot of the work that I do has a tactile element to it and I can feel um, and evaluate the qualities and the characteristics of the materials that I work with through touch. Um, so depending on how much time it needed based on the movement of the parchment, I would allow it to remain in place and then swap it out for a dry blotter. On top of this, a layer of felt, which helped draw moisture out again as well, uh, and some additional pressure for the drying process, followed by a sheet of plexiglass weighted down, and that helped keep the parchment flat so that it dried flatter and again, easier to utilize and access. Um, but it also helps prevent parchment from shrinking or distorting. When it's parchment is made, it's actually done under tension. It's dried under tension. And that gives some of the properties that parchment is notable for. So this again, was trying to keep uh, introduce little intervention and introduce as few changes as possible to the parchment while also making it easier to access and utilize safely. Um, again, so like I said, we, I was working to a bit of a deadline and this initial flattening was about all I really had time for uh, because by coincidence, we were expecting some visitors. Um, in June, 2019, we received a visit from members of the Hungerford family. These are relatives of James Smithson on his mother's side. And um, for all of you at home, you'll notice that the, the deed is referred to by the same family name, the Hungerfords. The properties that are represented in this deed were received through this same family connection. Uh, and so these are um, modern day cousins of our founding donor, James Smithson. Um, and a little shout out to them. We have a few Hungerfords, I hope, attending with us uh, this evening. So thank you so much for being with us. Again, the timing of this was completely coincidental. The, the Smithsonian had organized this visit quite a bit in advance before we knew that this was coming to us and before I knew that the deed was going to be joining us at the Smithsonian Archives and Libraries. Um, and so I wanted this to be available to, to show to them, to um, give this little piece of additional family history back to them so they can see it in context of what their uh, many times removed cousins the quest had done for uh, the world of cultural heritage and for the United States as a country. Um, but in addition to making this document like more visible, easier for them to see and access, we also wanted to be able to tell them something about what was in it. We really didn't know. Um, there was so much that we knew must be within it, but again, we expected it to be pretty straightforward, a lot of legal document jargon, not much more interesting than that. You can see in this image here that somebody had penciled on it, Smithsonian bequest. So the connection between Elizabeth Macy, um, Smithson's mother, of course, um, and her sister to James Smithson and the Smithsonian was clear to this individual uh, who, who left that there. But how much really did this have to do with him, with James Smithson, our founding donor? Wow, that 
preservation work was painstaking, but uh, you know, of course, it was it was necessary to allow you to quite literally open up the deed to to share it with others like the Hungerford family, um, and you know, to start to make these these fascinating discoveries. Um, and and what an appropriate debut, if you will, for the deed uh, with the Hungerford descendants. And yeah, I'll just um, echo that we are very honored to have some of them joining us this evening. Um, so I know, William, you've discovered so much since that visit. So tell us, uh, once you could actually see the contents of the deed, how did you start your research process? And you know, how did you learn more about what was in this document and what did you uncover? Yeah, um, as a like a very logical first step, what I really actually had to do to read it was to learn how to read the text. You can see from the images that the handwriting is not something that looks too distinct from what we would be familiar with today, but there are definitely some letters there that are unfamiliar in their shape. So I actually consulted quite a few paleography or handwriting tutorials, uh, including one from the United Kingdom's National Archives, uh, as well as my undergraduate alma mater, Brigham Young University, whose Special Collections Library has a great uh, tutorial for uh, medieval and um, through the 18th century handwritings of this sort. Um, so that was like a very preliminary step. Just even to be able to read it, I needed to learn what these different uh, letter shapes really were representing. Um, and I learned a lot really quickly, of course, even just from doing that. Um, I had to look up 18th century English property law terms to understand what was going on. And frankly, I started by Googling, uh, looking at looking for sources that could tell me anything and sifting through um, what I found for more reputable, for the most reputable sources from libraries and archives all over the world. And that helped me to get my bearings. Uh, there are some fantastic resources, for example, on the University of Nottingham's Manuscripts uh, Library website, which is fantastic, full of information about deeds and their legal conventions. But we have also uh, been able to utilize resources, of course, from the United Kingdom National Archives, as I've already mentioned, from the British Library and the British Museum, uh, from English Heritage, um, Historic England as well, which is how it's known now, and all kinds of really fantastic archival repositories and library collections, as I said, throughout the world. Uh, once I was able to really, as I said, get my bearings and see where I wanted to dive in deeper, that was where I really started to dig in. Um, truly, truly fascinating things, even for somebody who wouldn't necessarily have an interest in legal conventions of 18th century Britain, or a passion for parchment documents and conservation, there really is a lot. Uh, so, so, so much. Um, and as we said, juicy discoveries were made, much to our surprise. Uh, all of us expected something dry, something full of legalese, something more straightforward than what we found. But instead, we found, as Gabi has alluded to, a masterpiece theater worthy family history. Um, the first half of the deed is fully historical background. And this was very normal practice, um, but the story was a lot more complex, a lot more heated, a lot more passionate than I was expecting to find. And I would expect maybe uh, more than the average document from this period of time. So as we already mentioned, this document divides property between Smithson's mother, Elizabeth Macy, and his aunt, Macy's sister, Henrietta Maria Walker. I learned from the deed at the very beginning that these two women had become co-heirs to their younger brother's family inheritance after his early death. These lands were valuable sources of income. They were also a link back to their Hungerford ancestors who had been wealthy and powerful in the medieval period. Uh, one of their earliest ancestors was a man called Thomas Hungerford and he was the first recorded speaker of the United Kingdom's House of Commons uh, in 1387. He began a, a large family dynasty. Um, they had quite a bit of power. They were connected to English kings and queens. One fought with Henry V, the Battle of Agincourt in France. Um, but this didn't last forever. Their fortunes dwindled uh, and much of their wealth and influence was lost. But their family properties, including some described in the hunger for deed, did endure. So because um, Macy and Walker's brother didn't die uh, he died without a will. 
they automatically became his heirs by convention, by legal precedent. And this obliged them to go through a formal legal process of dividing up the properties between themselves. And this is called partition. And that's how the deed is identified on the back, um, on that endorsement, which describes what's within the deed. It took them a while to get around to this though. Uh, their brother died in 1766. The deed recounts next that Henrietta Maria was married to a man named George Walker three years later in 1769. And in her marriage contract, her half share in her brother's inheritance was settled on her, even though the partition hasn't been completed yet. And I, I wanna underscore here, I want to be very clear. Because that hadn't happened, she didn't yet legally own any of the properties, uh, but they were still theoretically settled on her. One of the really fascinating things about the text of the deed and this marriage settlement for Henrietta Maria is that the document makes it very clear that Henrietta Maria would be the sole owner of those properties that she was receiving out of her brother's estate. It even says that any husband she might have, including the one she was about to marry, would be forbidden from, quote, intermeddling in her property affairs. Fascinating. Um, and I, I love hearing about your research process. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's primary sources like this and, you know, the libraries and archives that care for them that are really the starting point for gaining a clear understanding of the past, which, you know, helps us better understand our present and helps inform our future. Um, and again, you know, it's, it's just amazing that, like you said, something that seems like it might be rather boring and, and dry, like a property contract from hundreds of years ago. Um, it really, it comes to life, you know, once you start to dig in deeper and, and investigate its contents um, and, you know, all the paths that that takes you down. Um, so, you know, for example, going back to Henrietta Maria, who, um, you know, sounds like she was an independent woman after my own heart. Uh, was, was this typical for women in the 18th century? Um, you know, can you share a little bit more about what you learned from your research about women's rights at the time? Yeah, of course. So I will, I will say the same, right? This felt very unusual to me. It felt atypical. Um, I think a lot of our view and definitely my personal view of the past is that women had fewer rights at, at earlier stages of history than we expect them to have now. Um, much of my historical background or the things I learned in school, right? It was women generally couldn't own property. Um, so this, this felt um, unusual to me. However, uh, I was able to, to learn through archival research that this in fact was not uncommon, um, but definitely limited to wealthy and privileged women like Macy and Walker. Um, this would not have been common for the average woman, uh, certainly not when her husband likely wouldn't own property at certain levels of society. Um, but it did always require a legal action of some sort to permit that power to women, like the marriage settlement that I was talking about earlier. Uh, interestingly, women could even get themselves legally declared what's known as a femme sole. Um, it's sort of a legal emancipation that allowed them to act independently of uh, a husband or another male relative. This was in pretty strong contrast to the usual practice of what's called coverture, uh, which considered a married couple to be legally one entity upon marriage, with the husband assuming ownership and control of anything that a wife would bring to a marriage. A femme sole instead could do as she pleased, even if she were married, and there are historical examples of that. To be clear, though, we don't know that, that Walker was ever a femme sole, but her marriage agreement of June 1769 guaranteed her autonomy over her lands. Uh, this image that you can see here is from uh, the Diocese of London records, registering the Walker's plans to marry. And you can see a description there of her husband, George Walker, who was actually a widower when he married Henrietta Maria. Uh, and she is identified there as a spinster, meaning just that she had never been married. Uh, it should be noted, though, um, even though Henrietta Maria was guaranteed control over her property in her marriage contract, what allowed to this to take place was the creation of a trust. Uh, which put two men in charge of managing her property who were supposed to take direction from her. Uh, I can imagine that in practice, um, 
women might still have been at the mercy of men in arrangements like that. Um, they were supposed to work for her good, uh, but she would have needed to keep a close eye on them, I assume, uh, to make sure that things were still being done to her desires. Um, and those individuals, of course, would have had to be the people that she trusted, um, absolutely. One of our goals in sharing this information and uh, our st the story from the Hungerford Deed is really to center the, the lives of these two women. Um, their relationship with each other really did shape uh, what we know uh, about James Smithson and certainly his own life. These events that the Hungerford Deed describes took place over his childhood and through his college career, his university career. So they would have been things that he was aware of, that society would have been aware of and, and probably talking about. Uh, and so their relationship and this story of the details helps us better to understand him as a person and as our founding donor through this family history. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think learning more about someone's family from their history and experiences to their personalities uh, is definitely incredibly enlightening. And, um, you know, I know you uncovered so many new details that give more context to James Smithson's motivations and, and values, um, which I know you'll talk about a, a little bit more a little bit later. So, um, but first, back to the story. So you were telling us about this partition. So yes. what happened next? Um, and how did things unfold between the sisters? Yeah, so we had been talking about the Walker's marriage in 1769. And it took another four years until 1773, when Macy and Walker decided to officially get the partition going. They hired a real estate expert to help them get through that technical process of doing the division. He worked out a split and they were poised to take next steps um, to, to carry out all the necessary paperwork to do all the required actions. But for some reason, Henrietta Maria refused to go any further with this process. Uh, you, we might surmise that she got cold feet for one reason or another. The deed says without any further explanation that she refused to take part in this process of partition. And this is what I have characterized as the, the central mystery of the hunger for deed. Why did Henrietta Maria refuse to take part? We can only guess. Uh, she might have felt she was entitled to more than she received. Uh, she might have wanted a particular property. Um, my research suggests that those don't really hold water. Uh, she got a more valuable group of properties than her sister did. And we know from correspondence that survives of hers that one of the properties that she particularly wanted, uh, called Studley House, was one that she did receive in the partition. We really don't know, and we can only guess, uh, but I am hopeful that an archive or library special collections out there might have a document that holds the answer to that question. So with this refusal in, in place, um, Walker's sister, Elizabeth Macy, again, James Smithson's mother, she allowed this to drag on for a while longer. Um, she may have attempted to persuade her sister to participate. She may have just been extraordinarily patient, um, which her history suggests is probably not actually the case, uh, but she did. She decided that enough was enough. So in 1782, she sued her sister in England's Court of Chancery. This was a high level court of equity that handled issues like this one between family members. Uh, and Dickens fans out there, will probably recognize Chancery as a setting for the novel Bleak House. Um, Henrietta Maria refused to appear in court though. Uh, and after another four years, the case was escalated up to the second most senior judge of Chancery, a man called the Master of the Rolls, which has a lovely, very 18th century uh, flavor to it that again, gives this, this lovely context to this story. Henrietta Maria, though, uh, despite summons to appear, refused. Uh, she continued to stand in contempt of court and defend herself. So the court ruled in Elizabeth Macy's favor, citing Walker's lack of defense as an admission of guilt. They, uh, the master of the rolls ordered some of his staff to draw up all of the needed paperwork to partition these family lands and the matter was finally settled. The crowning piece of that paperwork is the deed itself, the hunger for deed. James Smithson, he served actually as a witness to the deed. 
signing the door, so the back with his birth name, James Lewis Macy, which you can see there on the screen, the upper of the two signatures there. And we were able again to share all of this with uh, the, his modern Hungerford cousins when they visited us in June. Uh, and I think everybody was delighted to learn a little bit more of this family history, another piece uh, of that puzzle. Uh, my interest was still piqued. Um, I knew that there was more to dig into. I wanted to, to understand this more. I wanted to see what could be further teased out. I knew there were lots of juicy things there that, um, that couldn't be fully captured in a visit, um, even if somebody were to come and spend time digging through this with me on a personal level, right? Uh, coming to the archives and looking through the document with me. So uh, during the pandemic, I was able to dive really deeply into this research. Uh, you can see some of the different articles that I consulted, uh, learning more about chancery, for example. I looked at English deeds, uh, other similar property documents, as I mentioned, paleography, historical writing styles, uh, details about these English tax stamps, about wax seals, and what I might need to do to make sure that the one that we have on our deed uh, remains intact. Parchment conservation, and much more. I dug very specifically into the UK's National Archives to see if I could find related documents and thanks to uh, colleagues was able to get access to the text of some of them, uh, even though I couldn't of course visit during the pandemic to do research for myself, including uh, one of the most exciting things I was able to get was a transcript of that 1782 lawsuit between the sisters. Um, lots of family wills that gave context to some of the conflicts and claims between cousins and siblings uh, and, and much more, of course. Um, and none of this would have been possible for me if it weren't for the pandemic, frankly. Um, a little bit of a silver lining for me to working from home when normally I would be caring for treasures like the deed. Um, and I'd like to also say that um, this has been a very difficult time for so many people um, and I hope that sharing some of this content gives people something to, to look forward to uh, and to enjoy, uh, despite the difficulties that all, that all of us are still enduring on a global level. So again, as this research continued, a bigger picture began to emerge. Um, I began to collate the different things that I was learning uh, and, and to sort of annotate. You can see a little bit uh, my handwriting there, pulling out some of the points of interest that I found just on that first page of the deed. Um, and that's probably only a quarter of some of the things that I uncovered through the process of research. I began to see really that this would enrich our understanding of who James Smithson was um, because of this close relationship to his family members uh, and his own participation as a witness to the deed. Um, I had already been sharing a lot of what I found um, both before the pandemic and during with colleagues um, before the pandemic, you know, dashing down the hall to a friend's office and saying, you won't believe this thing that I learned. You won't believe what happened next. Or can you believe that they allowed this to happen, et cetera. Uh, during the pandemic, it was Teams chats and text messages or emails. And I just, I just developed this desire to be able to share this more and more widely. And from that, um, the, this, from, from that desire to share this further, um, a web exhibit uh, was formulated, which we launched uh, earlier this week uh, for the West Smithsonian as a contribution to the celebration of the Smithsonian's 175th anniversary. Yes, um, yeah, it's been so much fun to follow along with your with your progress, William. And you know, as you've discovered more and more dramatic details, um, and like you said, you know, and in keeping with our our mission to diffuse knowledge, I know you have been very very eager to share this story with the whole world. So um, it it is really so exciting to see this exhibition that does exactly that. And, you know, it makes this information accessible to anyone with an internet connection. Um, so tell us, tell us more about it. What can visitors expect? And, you know, what was your vision in creating this dynamic resource? So my vision from the beginning has been 
a virtual experience that allows visitors to get as close as close an experience as possible to coming to our reading room at the Smithsonian Archives, turning the pages of the deed themselves and having me at your shoulder, telling you things um, of note, explaining bits of context, who people were, what these places were that were described, what these properties might have been like that are divided up and um, pointing out particular things that are relevant and interesting. Uh, that would be, I mean, I'd love to welcome all of you at some stage to be able to do just that, but this is a fantastic substitute. We have accomplished that desire with an animated page turner. So you can very much click, click a button and turn the pages of the hunger for deed. And on each page, there are called out and highlighted little annotations. Um, if you click on them, up will pop a point of interest with more information. Some of the content, of course, will need uh, more context than what can easily fit in a pop-up, or sometimes it deserves a deeper dive. Uh, and as a result, we have six pages that tease out more about some of our principal characters, including uh, Smithson's mother, Elizabeth Macy, some of the coveted family properties, including Studley House, which I mentioned earlier, and another manor called Great Durnford, as well as the Court of Chancery, which was of course an important player in resolving this dispute between the sisters. There's also a glossary of legal terms that will give you a leg up on what I had when I started my research uh, and a bibliography that will give you more insight into some of the sources that we consulted uh, for your own research and interest. There are also uh, contemporary images throughout that we have sourced from other libraries and archives around the world to help illustrate what's going on. There are maps, there are images from wills, uh, engravings and prints, portraits, and so much more, which really paints this much more detailed, atmospheric period picture of what James Smithson's family was like and the social environment that they inhabited. The Hungerfords and their 18th century descendants um, were a proud, passionate people. And you can see from this family tree I put together that they were also a numerous group with lots of different family relationships there. They were, um, these Hungerfords, especially Macy and Walker, again, because of uh, surviving correspondence and research into their lives, they were fixated on, obsessed with this family history and with the associated legacy of wealth, influence, property and name recognition. Many of them had Hungerford as a part of their name and those who didn't sometimes changed it so that they did. Uh, Heather Ewing's fantastic biography of Smithson illustrates this incredibly well. Uh, and the deed is another evidence of this. And this allows us to argue confidently that Smithson's bequest to the United States for the increase in diffusion of knowledge uh, was a demonstration of this same family passion within him. He was equally consumed with his heritage. Uh, he wanted to leave his fortune to his nephew initially, a family legacy, if you will. But he also provided for a personal legacy if that first choice didn't pan out. He had devoted himself to science as, a, as uh, his life's calling. And his desire to be a benefactor of all mankind through the sharing of knowledge was how this bequest came to be within his own mind uh, and, and took form within his will. We are, and I am myself, so, so excited to be able to share this with you. And I honestly cannot wait to see what you think of this work. I hope that each of you will take some time and dig through it if you haven't already and, and be inspired. Uh, if there are, in, are areas of your own interest that you might want to explore more fully, or if there are bits of this that pique your interest in particular, and that might spawn um, more research that would give, again, a fuller picture of this story. Um, I do want to quickly thank some of my colleagues for their work um, in this too. Uh, my project manager, Emily Neckrish, our beta readers, Hannah Byrne, Jessica Scott, and Smithson scholar, Heather Ewing and our digital services group who helped make the technical aspects of this web exhibit possible, including Rick Ferrante, Andrew Weitzel, and Kira Sobers, as well as the team of contractors who created the, the viewer from Interactive Knowledge. 
Uh, and of course, I also want to thank our Smithsonian Libraries and Archives donors who so generously support our mission and make a lot of the different programs and activities that we undertake possible. We would not be able to do this without your support and it is very, very much appreciated. Yes, I, I know there are so many people who were involved with this project and, and made it possible. And um, I, I just wanna echo again that we are so grateful to our donors and in particular our stewards of the Hunger for Deed um, and our, our Smithson stewards, Mary and Clinton Gilland, uh, because again, without you, none of this would be possible. And um, yeah, so thank you for sustaining our mission and ensuring that the libraries and archives will continue to educate and delight audiences worldwide for years to come. So William, now that the ex exhibition has launched, can you tell us what is next for The Hunger for Deed? Yes, I can. And that's something that I have been thinking about um, for quite a while. There's a lot to do still. Um, as I mentioned, the initial treatment I did was very basic. It was super, super simple. Just enough to get the parchment to relax so that it could be handled more safely, more easily consulted. Um, we would like to relax a little bit further. And I have noticed um, on visits to the office recently that some of that relaxation and flattening has reversed a little bit um, over time, which is only natural. We would, again, so like I said, like to get it a little bit flatter again, and that will enable us to do some repairs and stabilization to areas of damage, which you can see circled there in red. Um, so we're hoping to be able to address some of that. I also want to give the wax seal on the front a little bit of attention. You can see that parts of it have already broken off. Um, if you look at this image here, there's a little bit of wax residue around the edges would have been a round or ovoid seal in the past, but that has broken away. So we wanna make sure that this can be preserved. The, the image there is, is, is beautiful. And again, gives us a little bit of the materiality of this period of time. Um, I, the deed is also in a temporary storage box uh, made by our fantastic preservation coordinator, Allison Rippert Gerber, uh, which was never intended to be a permanent solution. So I'd really like to make something custom. And this is a little drawing that I did several months ago, imagining what I might like to see there, including a support tube that helps um, the deed open gently. It, it's a support for the parchment pages to drape over to prevent creasing and cracking. And there's also an idea that I have noodling in my brain of a pressure plate that would put a little bit of gentle pressure on the parchment to keep it uh, flat um, as much as possible, but again, in a very gentle way. Uh, there is of course, much more still to do in terms of research, so much more. There are many details that we don't know, such as why Walker refused to participate in the partition at first. Uh, and those answers, I really, I believe they're out there. Um, we just have to find the right sources that can lend us insight to that information. I really, really want to put all the pieces of this puzzle together so we can have a better idea of all these circumstances to understand these people as individuals and human beings. Uh, the image upon the screen here shows a side-by-side -side comparison of a portrait of James Smithson on the left that we hold in the National Portrait Gallery of the Smithsonian. And on the right is a portrait of his father, the Duke of Northumberland from the Middlesex Guildhall Art Collection, which is displayed at the Supreme Court of the UK. And I think similar to the content in our web exhibit, seeing this information, seeing these images side-by-side -side allows comparisons to take place. The juxtaposition of that information and these visuals in particular gives a fuller and more complete picture of this period, of these people and their understanding and motivations. Bringing this all together has really allowed us to tell a more complete story, not just about the deed, but about our founding donor and thus the founding of the Smithsonian. The more information that we have, the fuller and clearer that picture is going to be. Thank you, William. Um, I, I definitely want to know more about Henrietta Maria and her story, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Um, and I know that additional preservation work is so crucial to make sure that this fascinating and important document survives in good shape for, for future generations um, who will likely be the ones to make 
further enlightening discoveries. Um, so I now want to open it up to our audience questions. So again, if you do have any questions for William, please submit them using the Q&A feature. So we've uh, gotten a few already. Um, so the first one, I think you might have already touched on when we were talking about the exhibit, but has the deed been transcribed and is it available online? So yes, the deed has been transcribed. That was one of the first things that I did as part of reading it through uh, to make sure that we understood the content uh, as, as well as possible. So yes, uh, within the web exhibit, in fact, there are individual page summaries of each page. So you can get an overview of what it says uh, to follow along with the story that's being told within the document. And there are also links to transcripts page by page. Yeah, it's great. Go check it out. Um, so this is a question about the sisters. Um, who was the younger sister and the older sister? And would that have had any impact? That's a really interesting question. I haven't thought really about it, but of course that would, that would definitely have an impact on their dynamic. So Elizabeth Macy, she was the oldest. Um, 1730, no, 1728. I'll have to double check those dates, but yes, she was the oldest by a few years. Henrietta Maria was the middle sibling and Lumley, their brother was the youngest. Uh, and I can certainly imagine that there was, um, as you might expect from a family, some sibling rivalry, some um, desire to be an independent person. I'm sure that that might have rankled on them that their younger brother would be the one to inherit all of those family things, even though that was the way it, it worked uh, back then. But yeah, I can imagine that that would definitely have, play, a, play a role in their relationship, absolutely. Uh, what a fascinating thing to consider. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, these two questions sort of go together. So first, what does the deed reveal about Elizabeth Macy and her personality? And then how did you learn about her, her and her personality? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the deed is, was a clue, an example of um, some of what Heather Ewing really uncovered and demonstrated in her book, The Lost World of James Smithson, about Smithson's mother, Elizabeth Macy. Uh, she was a real powerhouse in a lot of ways. She was a very independent woman. She was strong-willed. She knew what she wanted and she was not afraid to do what it took to obtain those things, including these properties, right? Um, I guess she could have tried uh, mediation to get her sister to assent to the partition, but she went ahead and sued her publicly in a court. Um, she was, uh, as Heather again shows in her book, she was a woman who was involved in an extraordinary number of lawsuits for any individual and particularly a woman of her period of time. Uh, and these were friends, they were neighbors, they were relatives. Uh, she um, sued her second husband who was um, a reprehensible individual in a lot of ways. Um, their relationship was volatile. Uh, to put it mildly, uh, and she actually sued him in court to prevent him from identifying himself as her husband. Uh, and so that gives you a little bit of insight into her, um, but at the same time, this makes her sound quite quite shrewish to use a little bit of an old-fashioned term, um, but she also was somebody who carried on a decades-long relationship with uh, the father of her children, the Duke of Northumberland, um, as a member of the aristocracy, he probably could have had his, his pick of, of partners, um, but they had a connection. Uh, and again, Heather has shown in her research that Elizabeth Macy was devoted to those who she, um, who she loved, including her son. Uh, and again, we, there's, there's more about this. I definitely recommend that people check out Heather's book, again, The Lost World of James Smithson, um, but also there is a deep dive on Elizabeth Macy in our web exhibit. And there is distilled a lot of this information that we have out there in archival uh, records that talk about her as a, as a complicated and fascinating woman, uh, truly, truly human um, and, and one who really comes to life through these resources that we have been able to study. Yeah, 
definitely. She's a fascinating individual. <laughs> um, so talking about the preservation side of things for a moment, um, sort of two questions here that I'll ask together. So is first, is the ink affected by the flattening process when you flatten the parchment? Um, and then second, has any research work been done on the actual seals, such as any relevance of the images that have been used um, in the portrait seals in particular? Sure. So um, the ink that was used on parchment documents is called iron gall ink. Generally speaking, that's what they would have used. And iron gall ink is acidic and it allows it to sort of bite into the, the stiff and strong parchment surface. Otherwise, ink would really just sit on top of the parchment. It wouldn't be quite as permanent. Uh, it might just flake off, for example, um, with abrasion. And again, that was, that was why they formulated the ink as it were. Um, to be to be strong enough to embed itself into the top layers of that parchment. So the humidification process again introduced relatively little moisture, um, and as far as we can tell, and um, based on safe practices that have been vetted by fellow conservators, um, it's 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 very very low risk if if a risk um, really at all. I think the risk is greater to the parchment than to the ink. In terms of research into the seal. Um, at this period of time, seals were not quite as meaningful personally to the people who used them. Uh, they were, they in the past would have been probably coats of arms, um, maybe a motto, something again of, of deep significance. But at this period, they were not as much. It was simply um, just the, the form that was part of that signing and sealing process. Presumably though, she picked it. Elizabeth Macy, we believe this is her seal. She would have chosen it for one reason or another. And images uh, of the seal, it has a very um, Hellenistic feel to it. This was the neoclassical period as well in, in England. So it fits in with the tastes of the time, um, but it sort of looks like it might be an image of Athena or Minerva, um, the goddess of wisdom, also the goddess of war. And I feel like those two dual aspects to Athena might have very much appealed to Elizabeth Macy as an individual for the reasons we've already talked about today. Definitely. Um, two follow-up questions to that, one related to conservation and one related to Elizabeth Macy. Um, the conservation side, is ink affected by the humidity? Some areas seem to have moisture damage. And then on the Elizabeth Macy side, did you run across any images of Elizabeth Macy? So in terms of the water damage and the ink, yeah, that can definitely, true water damage will have an impact on um, the ink deposited in the layers of the parchment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's also some, a, a lot of those areas that are water damaged and where the ink is less visible, they are on the outer pages of the deed. So they were subject to uh, possibly abrasion. They were the most distorted from the wrapping folding process. Uh, and again, most likely most vulnerable to damage. That's where all of the damage is on the exterior two pages of the hunger for deed. Um, so yes, there, there, there have been some impact as a result of that. Yes, absolutely. Um, but again, I'll just reiterate that the humidification process we use is very gentle and has been proven to be safe um, for that in that regard. In terms of images of Elizabeth Macy, there are no confirmed images of her. Um, and there aren't any of Henrietta Maria either for that matter. Um, but there has been a tentative identification of um, a George Romney painting as perhaps being that of Elizabeth Macy and her son, um, James Smithson, when he was young. But that is uh, not a definite thing, um, but we have um, utilized it in our web exhibit because it does give the flavor of the period. It, it belongs to uh, the same period of time. Um, and it has, again, the, it gives that atmosphere, that flavor of the period of time that we are hoping to convey by creating this web exhibit resource. And a follow up to that. Um, is there any evidence that George Romney knew Elizabeth Macy? 
you know, other than it being contemporary, what suggests that that image might be Elizabeth Macy and James Smithson? So I would have to defer to Heather Ewing, whose book, uh, again, The Lost World, James Smithson, um, brings up this possibility in the first place. It was her research and, and interest into a um, Romney exhibition that led to that, that idea that this could very well be the case. Um, and I'd have to refresh my memory on that in particular, but we would certainly be able to send a little bit of follow-up information um, with more information about that. Um, but the dates match. Um, and it looks like Heather may have put something into the chat that anybody that you can have a look at there. Um, but it's, I, I believe it is, is quite persuasive. Um, we just don't have confirmation that that is, um, that that is the case. Uh, and the, um, but it is a tantalizing possibility. So this is a question, um, or uh, again, I'll combine a couple questions. Um, so first, do you think it's possible that Henrietta didn't want to engage in this process because she was so aggrieved at the loss of their brother? And then um, in conjunction with that, um, do you, or why do you think Elizabeth Macy partitioned the properties in her sister's favor? You mentioned that Henrietta was given Studley House, for example. Good questions. So I would, um, I would be very surprised if Henrietta Maria's reluctance to participate in the partition was uh, a demonstration of mourning. Uh, it was several years later when they actually undertook the partition. Uh, and I also know that the two sisters didn't waste much time in asserting their claims to the properties, even though they were not yet legally owners. Um, that same property, Studley House, actually wasn't in their brother's possession when he died. He was actually suing a distant cousin's widow in order to get uh, to obtain possession of it. Um, and so shortly after he died, they renewed the lawsuit um, with themselves as the, um, as the plaintiffs. So uh, I, I, I have a hard time imagining that. It seemed like she was eager to get her hands on the properties, at least at the beginning. Um, and I don't know that a resurgence of guilt or grief over her brother's death um, would have uh, been a motivating factor, but again, we don't know. Um, and then in terms of the, the partition, why did Elizabeth Macy allow it to be in favor of her sister? Um, what you'll see if you visit the web exhibit um, and dig into that particular section is that they tried to make it as fair and equitable as possible of a split. And there was some, um, I don't know if drama is the right word, but there was some discussion about whether or not that would be possible. And the property expert found it um, not possible to, to have it be perfectly equal uh, in terms of size of property, in terms of value of the property. Uh, and so he did his best and proposed that the, that the two groups of properties or lots be drawn randomly out of a hat by a third party. So little slips with lot one and lot two were put into balls of wax placed in a hat and somebody drew them out um, at random. And that was how the properties ended up being allotted. Uh, two shares completely at random. Wow. <laughs> well, lucky Henrietta Maria. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, I think we'll just do one more question. Um, what surprised you the most in the deeds contents and conservation needs? Oh, those are great questions. What surprised me the most in the content? I mean, not a, a, not a very exciting answer. It's just the fact that this sort of torrid family history would be recounted in a legal document like this. It was certainly all relevant. Um, but, you know, in, but this family conflict enshrined in a legal document that would need to be consulted in the future should a sale of a property take place, which actually did. One of the most valuable properties was sold only a few years after the, the land was partitioned. Um, and so it's just like, 
I don't know, it just kind of surprised, it, it surprised me again that it was relatively baldly discussed uh, and that it would be again, sort of preserved in this state for so many years. And again, we don't have, um, we don't have all of the information. It's quite a high level summary, but even reading the lawsuit between the sisters um, in Chancery was super eye-opening. Um, Elizabeth Macy comes off frankly as a little paranoid, um, accusing her sister of confederating with her trustees, one of whom was actually their first cousin. Um, so that would have made for an awkward family dinner uh, if they invited extended family, although I imagine that was not really on the table, so to speak, at that stage. Um, but I, I guess it would really be, if I were to distill it down, it would be that there was so much emotion tied up in these properties. Um, and I, it is related to this family history, to this, to this link to previous periods of family prestige and glory that they were really eager to hold on to. I, I wonder if different misfortunes and, and life difficulties made this something that felt like to them it was the only good thing that they had going for them. Um, I, I can't say, I would love to find out. Um, and there's, again, not, not as much about Henrietta Maria out there as Heather has been able to uncover about Elizabeth Macy, for example. Uh, and that would definitely be a big focus of future research for me. Uh, in terms of the, the conservation needs, I think all things considered, it's in great shape for 200 plus years old. Um, the, coincidentally, the deed was completed right around the time that the um, Constitutional Convention was sitting in Philadelphia to create uh, the Constitution of the United States, which is like a neat uh, historical synchronicity. Um, so yeah, approaching 250 years old, Again, all things considered, I wasn't too surprised by what I found. Um, the, the structure of the deed, the binding of it is something that I have not seen before, but I think almost certainly was very common. So, um, and we won't be, we won't be uh, poking or prodding at that. Um, but that was a, an intriguing thing for me to see was how it was put together. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll note too, since this wasn't clear earlier, the order of the pages is actually backwards to what we would expect. We'd expect the top sheet to be the first one, but it's the reverse. The bottom sheet is the first page of the content and it moves up through the stack. And the bottom edge of that first sheet is actually wrapped around the bottom edge of the others. And that's what holds it all together with the ribbons and the, and the thread. So that was something new for me, maybe not a surprise as such, um, but yeah, it was a lot of what I expected, uh, but it will be a fun challenge to, to, um, to, to do the, the treatment that I envision. Wonderful. Well, unfortunately our time is up. So um, I, I certainly learned a lot and I hope everyone did as well. It seems like they did from the comments we've been getting. Um, so before we we go, I just I want to express our gratitude to all of you who who tuned in today, um, and again uh, to our stewards of the hunger for deed in particular. We we really can't do what we do without you, and your support has powered the Smithsonian for the past 175 years and is what will allow us to increase our impact for the next 175 years. So if you have not yet joined the stewards, it is not too late. We invite you to join this community of donors and hope you might consider making a donation today or in the coming weeks in celebration of this very, very special occasion and in support of knowledge and discovery. And as a steward, you will see your gift reverberate across the world, uh, just as James Smithson's has, benefiting generations to come. If you have any further questions or comments or, or feedback, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, and I am sure William would love to hear from uh, excited, enthusiastic uh, people who have been in, interested and intrigued by the deed. 
Um, and you can also reach our advancement team at sla-rscp at si.edu. And you can also share your thoughts by filling out our short survey after the session ends. So again, thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope you and yours stay safe and healthy. Good night.